This is where did the road go. Our aim is to explore the fringe, to be true skeptics and question openly, to investigate the paranormal, bring light to the dark corners of history, and give a voice to the shunned of science. We deal in mystery and the important questions that these subjects bring to light. What is reality? Who are we? And why are we here? Join us on the web at wheredidtheroadgo.com for a full show archive, links to all our social media, upcoming schedule, and much, much more. Now, join your host Soraya on this week's edition of Where Did the Road Go? Welcome to this edition of Where Did the Road Go? The last one for 2015. Tonight, we have the first of a two-part interview with Cheryl Lee Black. Now, Cheryl Lee has had uh, quite a number of near-death experiences in her life. And we're going to talk about those and the after effects. And uh, we'll branch out a little bit from there. She's also had a lot of work done on the... Uh, well, on the after effects and the psychokinetic abilities and such that she has developed as a result... We're not going to talk too much about that in this interview. We will have her on later in the year when she puts her book out, and we'll get more into that stuff. So for tonight, it's more her personal story, and uh, we get through two of the three main near-death experiences tonight. The third one and uh, all the major stuff that happened after it we'll be talking about next week. Now... If you are a patron, because this is a pre-recorded interview, you will get the second part right away. Plus a special uh, segment I recorded with her on a very weird thing that happened to her. Assuming probably a result of the near-death experience as well. So if you want to become a patron, it's only three bucks a month. You get all kinds of extra stuff. And uh, I'm going to keep trying to throw more and more extra stuff to patrons. I... It's, I really appreciate the support of everyone so far. You can also support the show just by spreading the word. Tell people about the show. Recommend it to them. Everything's appreciated. And now into our interview with Cheryl Lee Black. All right, and we're talking tonight with Cheryl Lee Black. And uh, how are you doing tonight? Oh, good. Thank you for having me. Well, thank you for coming on. You've had a, a wealth of very ex interesting experiences, which you are working on a book about. And you're working on a book, and you're getting helped by Kenneth Ring. <laughs> Is that the only reason you're talking to me? <laughs> no, no. I started talking to you, and then you told me that, and it just blew my mind. Yeah, it's, I think it's a little known secret that he actually um, has helped quite a number of near-death experiencers put their stories into books there's quite a number of them out there and he does it kind of just very quietly and doesn't seem to want a lot of attention for doing it but yeah he's really really nice and he's been helping me a great deal that's awesome yeah. um how much of the book is done um i've got about seventy thousand words down <laughs> do you have a lot left to write or um i've got a first draft complete and i'm just kind of going through and editing a bit and adding some stuff in that i thought should be in there hmm, so yeah okay. it's it's getting pretty pretty close to being done <laughs> so maybe early 2016 well we'll see <laughs> <laughs> everyone keeps rushing me gee Oh, i'm not trying to rush you i just want to read the rest of the book you sent me a few chapters and they were fascinating <laughs> Um, so I guess, I guess we should start at the beginning, which is, uh, when you were a child, you, you've had a number of near-death experiences in your life. And the first one, how old were you? Um, I would have been a toddler. So I was like between two and three. Okay. And what happened? Um, well, I was, I was basically doing what I wasn't supposed to be doing. It, it would probably, I, I'm guessing it would have been like Christmas holidays or in the winter, I mean, I grew up in Winnipeg, so win winter is like six months of the year. But, right. Um, <laughs> but I just I remember that it was sort of sort of in the winter, and we had company over, and the dog. I had a pet dog. It was a huge, old uh, monstrosity of a mutt, and I guess it had been locked in the basement, st 
stay away from the nice company. <laughs> Mm-hmm. And I wasn't supposed to be old enough to unlock doors, and I did. <laughs> Surprise. Surprise. <laughs> and I was playing on the stairway with a rather large dog, and that's not a very good um, not a very good situation to be in when you're a toddler. And how, how everything's happened, I took a header down the stair and uh, it clonked myself on the head pretty badly. Mm. And... Um, you know, and I mean, at the time, I, I guess one of the things that is so different about, you know, my childhood experiences versus, you know, the, when I was an adult is that when you have this as a child, you really get the sense that there's kind of like two yous, that there's little, there's little you, little toddler you who wants what little toddler you wants. And then there's this kind of bigger <laughs> you that seems to know all this stuff that you don't know. And mm-hmm. and that you don't necessarily agree with, <laughs> kind, kind, of like, <laughs> kind of like kind of like your higher self. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm sure that's what it is, but it's just it's so pronounced when you're a child. <laughs> the, the sure, you know, the difference between the sort of other other self that just knows all this stuff and is kind of unconcerned about everything. And then you who, you know, I mean, I just wanted my dad. <laughs> it was kind of how I felt throughout it. But I just remember this lady picking me up and I didn't know who she was. And it was just this really beautiful kind of purple light, purple and indigo blues. It was like a dark, sparkly light. And I just remember not feeling any pain. Like, you know, even though I obviously had clonked myself on the head. And I, mean, I still have a scar from that. <laughs> um, but uh, there was like no pain. I just remember feeling incredibly protected and loved and everything was great. But then I wanted my dad. <laughs> I was kind of, you know, I was like, well, yeah, you, lady, you're fine, but I, I still want my dad. <laughs> right. And, and that was kind of what I remember, you know, the next thing I really remember was dad was there and that was that. Hmm. And and how badly were you hurt? Um I don't I don't really know. I like so I know I have a scar from it cuz um because I remember when I when I joined the military later on in life I had to account for all of my scars. So that was how I got, <laughs> huh. so that was how I found out where I got that one. <laughs> ah. My mom kind of explained well actually my mom had difficulty figuring out which incident I was pretty um i i was not the best behaved little kid ah, ah. <laughs> you know i mean so did you remember the experience but not necessarily the injury yeah you know i don't i had so many injuries as a kid and they you know when you're a kid they're just kind of come and go you don't really think of them or dwell on them it's like yeah whatever i whacked my head <laughs> I mean, my, I'm sure I did it. You know, my mom says that, that uh, you know, I used to run under the kitchen table and I clunked myself on that at one point when I grew too tall. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, and so this woman <laughs> that you had in the experience turned out to be uh, a relative. Yeah. Um, I mean, I didn't know who she was at the time because she had died before I was born. And... Uh, I didn't, I didn't really know who she was till years later because we didn't even put pictures of her in the house. It was my mom's mother who had passed away really tragically young. Um, and my grandfather just was heartbroken. He was actually 20 years older than she was. So he had no expectation that she, you know, that he would outlive her. Right. And uh, so when she died young, it just, it just crushed him. And actually... That was the second wife he lost too. His first wife had died in a train crash. Mm. Um, so he really, he, he really didn't uh, handle that very well. But yeah, so I mean, when I was a little kid, I continued to see her um, through childhood, and she was like, you know, my first imaginary friend. Huh. When, when did you realize who she was? Um, oh, gee, I would have been pretty much my teens. Once I knew, 
I think I think my grandfather suspected. He used to look after me a lot. My mom worked, and he would look after me. And apparently, every so often, I would say words in German, which is I, all of my grandparents spoke different languages, and my grandmother um, spoke German. And so, you know, he would recognize the words and wonder where they came from, because mm-hmm. nobody else in the family was speaking that. <laughs> Huh. So what was the thing that finally made you realize who she was? Um, I found, um, I actually finally got to see pictures of her in family photographs. Mm. That was the night, and I recognized her. So I saw her wedding picture with my grandfather. It was put away. I bet that freaked everyone out. Well, I didn't tell anyone. By the time I was oh, old okay. enough to know, there was absolutely no way. I think my grandfather knew when I was little, and I think, I think he suspected something was going on because clearly I was talking to somebody and he, he looked after me an awful lot. Um, I, I was very spoiled. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so did, what were the after effects of that first one besides seeing your grandmother? Um, well, I mean, that was kind of a big one. <laughs> well, sure. <You> know? <laughs> um, I think my mom and my dad actually, the thing that kind of freaked them out is I seemed to, it w- became very hard to keep secrets from me. I, I, huh. I seemed to be having precognitive experiences. I mean, the joke was you could never hide a Christmas present for, from me. <laughs> <laughs> but I always knew what I was getting. And, and it drove my mom nuts because she used to put booby traps where she'd hide the Christmas presents every year. And she said that she could always tell who was looking because where all the stuff that was for my brothers um, had clearly been, you know, the booby traps were set off. So she knew that they had been there. The stuff that was for me, she could never figure out how I knew it was there without setting off any of their little traps. <laughs> now, wasn't there a story, too, about how you, you told them what you were getting and they, it wasn't something they had gotten you? Yeah, there was... It it was around the time when I was just getting to the age where, you know, children may not believe in Santa anymore. Uh-huh. And my dad, because I was the youngest, my dad wanted one last Christmas where I still believed, you know, like that was, he just wanted to have that one last one because it's, you know, that's, it's a really special time when you have kids, when they just believe everything at Christmas time that they're supposed to. And my brothers right. had been given like, you know, given every warning possible that they were not to ruin Christmas for me that year. <laughs> Especially my oldest brother, he was five years older and he knew everything. He was, you know, he was Mr. Smarty and he was, you know, he was going to tell everybody how this worked <laughs> and he was told not to. And, and I had wanted for Christmas that year, or at least I said I was getting for Christmas that year was this um, tea set, like a blue porcelain floral tea set. And I described it lovingly, you know, like I knew exactly what I was getting. It was this wonderful tea set that, uh, you know, it was going to, you know, it was just going to be perfect. And my parents tried to find this thing everywhere. I mean, and back then it was pretty much just like the Sears catalog is where you got the toys from. And, you know, and they couldn't find anything like what I was describing. And, And they looked everywhere and you know it was really they were getting very worried as it got closer and closer to christmas they were really starting to think well they're gonna have to ruin christmas or you know i'm i'm gonna be disappointed and they kept saying well you know isn't there anything else and i'd be like no this is what santa's bringing me you know like don't worry about it. Santa has this covered. I don't see what the problem <laughs> is. Like, you know, this it's going to be great. I'm going to get this tea set and it's going to be just the best. And so my poor parents were really, you know, they were really trying everything to try and get me this tea set and they couldn't find one like it anywhere. It just didn't seem to exist. And then my, my dad had a company Christmas party every year where they had Santa Claus hand out presents to all the kids in the company. And so they took me to the company Christmas party that year. And as it turned out, my present from Santa handed directly to me from Santa, just like I said it was going to be, was this tea set. 
<laughs> and and you know and and like my parents were shocked because they couldn't even they didn't even know what was in the packages i mean you get the wrapped gift from santa then you go back to your parents and you unwrap it well i was thanking santa for it on his lap i knew exactly what was in that box and i went down and i was already like you know, here it is, and I'm unwrapping it, and it's like, there it is. It's porcelain. It's got blue flowers. <laughs> it's exactly <laughs> what I told you Santa was getting me. And, you know, I swear there was, like, no Santa skeptics in our house. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I guess not. It was like, the, you know, even my oldest brother was kind of <laughs> looking at that one. And so, yeah, that's my dad's favorite Christmas story. He says that <laughs> he said that he was so worried, and Santa came through. <laughs> <laughs> huh all right so let, let's move on to your second near-death experience now this, this one was not such a pleasant one for you no this one i may have trouble talking to okay all right. um and I, I and i will preface this to say that i was actually probably i probably found it easier to talk about before i had gone to near-death conferences because the first thing you find out is not to talk about the distressing experiences. And why is that? Um, you know, there's just this underlying prejudice against it that, I mean, I didn't even realize that there were negative near-death experiences. I had, I had done, um, you know, questionnaires and studies with Bruce Grayson for both of my positive NDEs. And I had never filled out one for the um, frightening NDE because I didn't think that there was such a thing as a frightening NDE. And mm. I even asked researchers questions about it because, you know, they talk about, is it realer than real and do you remember things? And I'm like, well, how do you tell between a near-death experience and these really scary experiences that fit all the same criteria? <laughs> right, right. You know, and, and people would say, oh, well, you know, there you know, th that doesn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it was hard. And like the first conference I went to, um, you know, um, somebody who was doing documentary film on NDE said, oh, are you one of the near-death experiencers? Would you mind speaking to us for our documentary? And I said, oh, okay. And, and then I accidentally let it slip that one of my, ne one of my experiences was a frightening one. And the woman just looked at me and said, oh, excuse me, I have to go do something right now. And she got away from me as fast as she could. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And somebody else at that conference said, oh, nobody wants to hear about those <laughs> experiences. <laughs> and, and, and somebody else had, you know, told me that, that it meant I was going to hell for sure the next time. <laughs> oh, that's always comfortable. Yeah. And then, of course, I was asked, what did you do to deserve it? <laughs> Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I, I mean, you can point out that saints have had distressing near death experiences. And so I'm sure I don't think they deserved it either. Yeah. You know. Well, what, what, how old were you when this happened? I was 10. Okay. And this was from an appendix. Yeah. Um, you know, my. Uh, it had happened like on a Monday morning, and it was close to Easter. And so I guess there was a lot of candy in the house. And I think my parents were figuring that my Monday morning tummy ache had more to do with Easter chocolate than anything serious. Right. <laughs> or a desire not to go to school that day. I mean, my brothers were absolutely beside themselves that I must be faking it. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, brothers are like that. <laughs> oh, sure. You know, and um, so... So, you know, my mom had to get to work and my dad had to get to work and they were trying to gently get me to admit that I was just faking it not to get out of school that day and stay home and eat candy while my brothers had to leave the house. Um, but uh, in the end, I had a very high fever and my parents took me to the family doctor's office. Now, what they should have done if they had known was to drive me straight to the hospital. Sure. And but they didn't do that. And back then you could get a family doctor's appointment. I mean, had they given him a bit of notice, he'd probably made a house call back then. But oh. yeah. <laughs> but you know, they right. they took me to the office there and he very quickly had me in an ambulance on the way to the hospital. And I, I'm guessing my appendix had probably already burst by that point, but I 
I don't know all the medical details of it. I just know I was in pretty rough shape. And when we got to the hospital, my parents were essentially just pushed away from me and I wanted them there. And I just, it was like, it was a really horrifying experience. I wanted my mom and dad and they were pushed away. And I was just in so much pain. And then every so often I kind of pop out of myself. And it, it was almost like being sucked in and out of a straw. <laughs> now, now were these your, your first out of body experiences? Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and when I was sort of outside of myself, it was so much better. Like, you know, it didn't hurt. Right. And when, and then I get sucked back into myself and, oh my God, it was just awful. Um, and it sort of went kind of back and forth like that for a while until I just kind of stayed out. And at, at the time, I really wanted my mom and dad. Like, that's all I could focus on. Oh, well, sure. And out of myself, I could go find them. And I did. And they were in the waiting room and they were having a not very nice argument about what was going on. <laughs> now, you know, when you're, when you're a kid, <laughs> you have very idealistic ideas about mom and dad. Sure. You know, and I, and I was just at the age where some of my friends' parents had gotten divorced and it was like the, just seemed like the most horrible thing that could ever possibly happen. And, you know, and I, I worried about things like that. That, you know, and I, and so I'd never really seen them arguing, and and they were arguing. Now, as an adult, now I know that they argue like that all the time. It's no big deal, <laughs> you know. Um, you know, they're still together. It's close to sixty years. They're still together. <laughs> um, you know, and and it's not a big deal. But at the time, I just thought my world was ending because <laughs> oh my god, they're arguing. <laughs> right? <laughs> How can they be arguing? And. Um, I kind of bailed on the situation in a way. Um, it, like, it's hard to explain it, but that was, I just, it was like, I wanted to run away from everything at that point. Yeah. You know, I mean. So they, were, they were arguing about you, weren't they? Well, sure. They were arguing because, you know, my mom figured it was, you know, their fault for not taking me to the hospital right away that I was going to die. And, and my dad being the, you know, the eternal optimist was like, no, she'll be fine. She'll be fine. Don't worry. You know, it's, it's fine. And my mom who tends to take a fairly negative view on things, is like, no, and it's all our fault. And we did this. And, you know, right. You know, I mean, I mean, and I can understand that. And let's face it. um, Parents of children who die, those marriages almost never survive it. Well, sure. Yeah. And and so did that make you feel like that, like this fight was because of you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah absolutely. I, you know, um, I, I felt absolutely responsible for, for mm-hmm. what was going on. And I mean, I think kids at that age, age really do take, you know, they think everything is their fault. They think the world revolves around them. <laughs> right. You know, and yeah, so I, I did. And I wanted to just get away from it all. And that's kind of what I did. And what happened then? Um, (laughs) Oh, dear. It's, it's, it gets hard to describe it. This is like, this is like where, you know, when they say there's no words for this stuff, there are no words for this stuff. Um, But. There, there were lights there. I mean, it wasn't like I was alone in that other way of existing. I mean, actually, my grandmother was there. Um, there were other imaginary friends that I had that were there. Um, and at the time, I was just kind of mad at adults. <laughs> Understandable. <laughs> you know? It was just, you know, I, I was mad at the doctors. <laughs> I saw, you know, like they pushed my parents away. And I, I saw actually, I had actually seen them working on my body, which was just horrifying to me too. Um, 
you know, to this day, I'm afraid of doctors. <laughs> <laughs> that's understandable. I mean, that's not not a pretty procedure. Uh, no. <laughs> um, and uh, you know, I just i i didn't i i didn't want my imaginary. I didn't want my grandma. Like I said, I I just saw them all as part of the adult conspiracy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think I was starting to get into that age where you don't like adults anyway. Right. You know, I was ten, but girls kind of mature quick. And uh, so I just wanted to get away from all adults <laughs> and everybody that, that, you know, that was upsetting me so much. Uh -huh. And I kind of just ran away, except that you don't really run because you're not really in a body, you, yeah. you know, but it's more of a, it's more of the concept of running away that I was doing. Right. I guess. I don't have a good way to, to put that. That's okay. That's all right. Um, you know, so I just got really lost. It's all I, all I can, all, all I can say about that. I just got incredibly lost. It's like the universe was just so big. And I actually had that understanding of that bigger self. This, uh -huh. The same as I did when I had my first NDE, I still had that sense that, that there was kind of two me's. Right. And there's this one me. And in some ways, I almost rejected it because it was that, that scummy adult me. That, <laughs> <laughs> that know it all. That had all this information that I really was not willing to accept. Like, you know, like the idea that boys were not scum. I wasn't ready for that. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly, was not ready for that one yet. <laughs> and hey, what, why, why did that idea come up? Uh, what were you seeing? Um, well, a lot of what I was seeing, I, I mean, I saw details of my first marriage, <laughs> mm. which you know, no ten-year-old wants to know about. <laughs> yeah, you know, um, I saw. I actually saw the car accident that I'd have years later, which I, I mean, you know, and that kept me from getting a driver's license till I was 25. <laughs> Understandable. Yeah. Um, you know, I was very, very reluctant to, to drive because, you know, I had that memory and I kept telling myself for years, it's not going to happen that way. But I actually got these kind of two visions of the future. And, uh -huh. and I saw one version where I lived and my family was okay. Like my mom and dad didn't split up. My, you know, everything, life went on as normal. My, you know, my brothers were annoying, but fine. And, uh -huh. and, you know, and I was me and everything worked out okay. But I also saw the flip side of things that if I had died and, you know, if I had gone into light and stayed there, um, that my parents were not going to stay together. Um, then they'd divorce. Then the future would be bad for my whole family as my brothers would die young. Um, my dad would be heartbroken. My mom would have all these failed marriages. And I just saw this really horrible future for my family where it just, the whole family unit just seemed to crumble if I wasn't there. Right. And And yeah, I know that 10 year olds do kind of place too much authority in themselves, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, you know, like I can fix things or it's all my fault or you have those feelings when you're young, but it really did seem like I had all this information and I didn't know what to do with it. And I didn't want the responsibility of having to decide what to do with it. And, you know, I just wanted to get away from all of that. And so I, Kind of just like I said, I just ran as far away as I could, even though quite honestly, what I really wanted to do was I wanted to go into that nice inviting light because mm. um, it was there. It wasn't like I didn't know there was a light there. I knew it was there and I knew if I went into it that there was no way I, I'd talk myself into leaving it. Right. 
and the kind of adult presences like my grandmother that, that were there they, they were telling me that well if you want to go back you can go back and I didn't believe them I wasn't believing adults and I kind of just went where there was just nobody who could find me and I felt lost and forlorn and I mean I know when you talk about these experiences it doesn't sound bad like I get that that it just sounds like oh it's a little kid and she's taking too much responsibility but it's not the end of the world and the problem with a distressing near-death experience is there's no way to to really convey how strong the emotions are it's the same as when i talk about the blissful experience i can say wow it was really blissful and a bigger love than there is love and all those words that you'll hear end ears use but it doesn't really give you that experience but for some reason people are more willing to be accepting of the idea that there's this really big love than they are to be accepting of the idea that there is this absolute sense of loss and desolation mm. that you can also experience to the same extreme. And so that was, you know, the closest thing I've ever been able to come up with was when you're a really little kid and you're, say, in the supermarket with your mom. And you let go of her hand for a second, just because, you know, <laughs> you're feeling brave. And you let go of her hand for a second, and then you turn around and she's gone. And that feeling of, oh, my God, I need her. Where's mom? My whole world is mom, and mom isn't here. You know, like, you know, little kids, when they realize they've lost their mom, it's just the end of the world for them? Oh, yeah, Absolutely that's the closest I've ever come to any experience here to how my, my negative near death experience felt like that's, that's the best I can come up with. And it was a lot worse than that, hmm. that I just felt absolutely and utterly abandoned and alone. And like, it was all my fault. Cause you know, it's like when you're a kid, I let go. It was my fault. Why did I let go of mom? Yeah, right. Like you, you know, it's your fault. You just, you know, um, and that was what it was like. It's like, I did this to myself. Why did I do this to myself? It's all my fault. I deserve this. Um, and I'm going to be just alone and desolated in this eternity. Cause this is, this is where I am at. This is just this big eternity and, and it's empty and I'm alone. And, I actually encountered things there that were kind of scary. Um, like, I think, I mean, the closest I ever came up with was that they reminded me of the bad aliens in my brother's comic books. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I was at that age where my brothers were really into science fiction. They'd like watch Twilight Zone and Rod Sterling and things that just gave me nightmares. <laughs> were these things you felt or did you actually see things? I saw things. I mean, they were like these, these weird, I don't know, I don't, I, entities or like there was an intelligence to them, but they just seemed lacking in light somehow. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't, I don't think that they were evil. I just think that they weren't necessarily nice. <laughs> and I was very frightened of them. Like, like sort of uh, like a void I just, I, I remember feeling like they were going to suck my light away from me. Like they wanted my light. It's, okay. That was kind of the only thing I could really characterize them as. Um, like it, they wanted something from me and it was something that I wasn't willing to give to them. Okay. And I was frightened of them. Understandable. And, uh, you know, it, and, I'm, and I'm sure a lot of people at that point are saying, well, those were demons. Yeah. See, I didn't have that. <laughs> I, actually, that never occurred to me because <laughs> I only had the evil, nasty comic book references growing up. Cause, right. Cause I'm a heathen. But <laughs> um, so, yeah, I don't know what they were. It just seemed like they wanted stuff that I wasn't willing to give them. 
And mm. at that point, I remember asking for help. I mean, it's as simple as that. I just, and I didn't want to, like, you have to understand that it was like the thought of asking adults for help. <laughs> <laughs> Especially at that point. Yeah. It was like, no, I'm not going to, I'm just going to sit out here and suffer for eternity and I am not going to ask for help. <laughs> Screw that idea. <laughs> And, but, you know, it was just, I finally kind of hit the depths where I, I called for help. <laughs> and it came pretty fast. <laughs> you know, um, it, it's, it's one of those weird things. And it it's always seems strange to me. Like, why did I have to ask? Why couldn't they just come and get me? <laughs> but they let me, you know, free will, I guess. You know, they let me, yeah. they let me do what I wanted to do. And when I asked for help my grandmother was there and she, you know, there was still, I had the option of going into the light and I had the option of going into the light and not staying there, but going back to my parents, just kind of enjoying it until it was, till I had to come back. But I did not trust myself to go into that light. I thought if I go in there, there's just no way I'm coming back and I'm going to feel so guilty and horrible if I don't come back because you know things will be bad for my family and even my brother might miss me and you know I, I just I thought I, I'm just not going to go there and I really wanted to but I decided not to and hmm. and uh, you know and has it turned out you know I did come back <laughs> right right and uh yeah, I had nightmares about it for years afterwards. And I, up until that point, I was like the cute kid in school. <laughs> you know, I mean, I was a really cute little girl. I was, I was the youngest in all my classes. I was the tiniest in all my classes. I was petite for my age. So I looked really, really little compared to all the other kids. And, and, and I got a lot of attention for being just so tiny and so cute. And, and suddenly I was like, not the cute child anymore. You know, um, my, my, I was essentially, I had essentially gone through a spiritual emergency back before anyone had any concept as to what that was, hmm. you know, and the school system didn't know how to handle it. Um, my parents didn't know how to handle it. Like my, my mom was at a complete loss. Like, where's her kid? <laughs> <laughs> like you're not you're not my kid anymore um it, it was really i became you know like i know that there's that age where all kids become kind of ugly <laughs> and that's part of it i was getting into that but there was also this fact that i'd gone you know i'd gone through into a spiritual emergency and you know the guidance counselors at school were thinking that it had to be something different you know, that maybe I had a learning disability, although, you know, like they, they suddenly I, I went through every test in the book to find out what was wrong with me and they couldn't find anything wrong. I wasn't, I didn't have a learning disability. Um, I wasn't being abused at home, you know, like the, all the, all the things that they could understand um, didn't seem to be causing my distress at all like i had nightmares i wouldn't i wouldn't uh, sleep at night i'd i'd um i'd go to bed wait for the adults to go to sleep and i'd get out of my bed and go hide in the closet <laughs> hmm. you know <laughs> yeah and then i'd fall asleep in school and get in trouble <laughs> <laughs> which just gets you labeled as a bad kid at that point yeah yeah, so I was serious, and I and I started to live up to the, you know, I mean, children live up to what uh, people think of them, <laughs> and I, oh, yeah, absolutely, you know, and I absolutely became the bad kid. I mean, I was the child from hell. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, well, let's let's take a quick break, and we'll be right back with Shirley Black. Where Did the Road Go can be heard first and usually live on WVBR Saturday nights at 11 p.m. Eastern. Go to wheredidtheroadgo.com to ask questions of our live guests through the chat room. 
Where Did the Road Go is then re-aired on Dark Matter Radio and Deprogrammed Radio. You can download all shows for free on the website, and you can subscribe to us on Stitcher, iTunes, YouTube, or Vimeo. Additional content can be found on our video channels. You will also find our upcoming schedule, book reviews, blogs, free book downloads, links, and more. We are also on Facebook and Twitter, and if you want to help support the show, there are links to donate to us. Everything you need can be found at wheredidtheroadgo.com. All right, we're talking with Sherry Lee Black, and uh, you were you were talking about the after effects of this uh, second near death experience, and uh, it, it kind of made you made you kind of the outcast. Do you feel it it matured you beyond like your your age? Actually, no. <laughs> uh, mm. In many ways, I wanted to stay as childlike as possible. Uh, you know, it's funny because I had that exposure to sort of that bigger me, that that all that adult knowledge. Right. And I didn't want anything to do with it. <laughs> I think there's a lot of people who don't want anything to do with it, regardless of how old they are. <laughs> well, I, I really did not want to do with it. I mean, and, you know, like my friends were starting to get attracted to boys and I was just horrified. I thought it. I, th- I thought. I thought it was just kind of a hormonal haze was taking over them and, <laughs> you know, impairing their cognitive abilities. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it. I mean, I was seriously just not going to go there if I could at all. You know, if there's any way to stop it. And, um, and and I mean, I was getting so tired. <laughs> like like really, I was not getting any sleep. I was having nightmares. I was having OBEs, which mm. scared me. And usually they'd kind of happen at night. Right. You know. And they and they weren't things that you were trying to do. No. <laughs> no. And in fact, in some ways, I felt guilty about it because at the time I thought, no, no, I have to stay in my body and live out my life so that <laughs> everything will be good. And then right. I'd pop out of my body and I'd be like, oh, no, no, I have to get back in. Like, this is bad. This is just not, you know. And sometimes I think probably because I was so tired, I didn't always even realize um, that I was out of myself. Mm-hmm. And like when when I was in the hospital having the distressing experience and I saw my parents arguing, I tried really, really hard to get them to see me, you know. And that was one of the, actually that was actually quite distressing just in and of itself. The fact that when you're 10 years old and your parents are there arguing and they can't see you, you know, and I and I couldn't understand how they couldn't see me because I I was right. here, you know. And the same things happened to me as a 10 year old, where I'd have these nightmares and I'd be afraid of the things in my you know the bad entities in my. In, in my NDE, I was afraid they would come, they were coming to pull me out of my body and take me away. And hmm. um, so I would, I thought I was running around the house trying to wake everybody up and no one seemed to wake up and no one seemed to see me. And I couldn't even wake up the family dog. And, <laughs> and now I kind of looking back and going, yeah, I probably was already OBEing and I didn't realize it. Yeah. Wow. And I, I'm kind of surprised the dog didn't at least notice. Well, by that point, it was an old dog. It was the same dog that I... <laughs> oh, oh. It was, yeah, it was, one. yeah, it was getting to be an old dog by then. <laughs> huh. In fact, actually, it would go to sleep in the bed when I was hiding in the closet. <laughs> <laughs> um so, so th- were the nightmares related to the experience, or were they just other things? No, they, I mean, I was sure that those things that I saw were coming back for me. I I was absolutely sure that I saw them at times. Um, And I think one of the things that kind of made it worse was um, I grew up in Winnipeg in the mid 70s. And about a year after my distressing experience, um, there were all these reports of like UFOs in the news. Uh Um, And it was like right near where, my family 
was um my mom's family was from uh, just south of Winnipeg and sort of the Morden Winkler area, which is near Carmen. You actually drive by Carmen to get there. And at that time, there was something called um, Charlie Red Star. And the local news were like filming this little red light that was showing up in the farmer's fields. And it was, so it was on the local news. Mm. And it was kind of a big deal at the time. Like people actually sat out in their lawn chairs to watch this thing it showed up so regularly and and i think that that really added to you know the whole issue that i was afraid that maybe these things from my dreams that kind of looked like my brother's scary alien comic books and now there's ufos <laughs> you know, that it must be that these things are coming to get me <laughs> right, right. You know, that was kind of it was like my nightmares were showing up in the local farmers fields <laughs> yeah that's comforting for a kid yeah. <laughs> yes yeah and like i said and it seemed legitimate because it was being shown on the evening news right right do they do they ever have an explanation for it no no hmm. no in fact actually i've seen old footage where jacques Vallée talks about that particular case interesting yeah <laughs> um do you do, would you describe what you experienced after the the second one like a form of uh, post traumatic stress syndrome? It might have been something like that. Um, I think that I, I think that one of the problems was that when I was trying to describe what was going on with me to the adults, they just kept telling me, "Oh, it's just a nightmare. Don't worry about it." Sure, you know. And, and like same, you know, when I got woke up in the hospital, I mean, it, oh, it's just a nightmare, kid. Just don't worry about it. And I think that's a really, and the experience, I mean, is realer than real. I mean, this many years later, it's just as real to me, and just as, um, I remember it just as well as I do the near death experience I had when I was twenty nine. Mm. Um, with the same well, level of clarity, you know. Would you say like uh, like reality is a an old TV signal, whereas like the the near death experience is like a 4K TV? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, except it's more like well, I don't know. Are 4K TVs like you know four dimensional experiences too? <laughs> I mean, you know, like okay, like. <laughs> you know. But I mean, but I mean that much of a difference. Yeah. Between one and the other. Yeah. And, you know, like, it's just so real. And so when people are telling you, oh, it's just a nightmare, you, you know, for a while, you know, growing up, I really had difficulty understanding what just a dream meant. Mm. Because the dreams could seem awfully real. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, it, it, I think the biggest issue for me is it wasn't too bad at home because my parents were... I, mean, I was raised by hippies, and they were pretty tolerant of whatever I did. <laughs> and but but um, at school, um, particularly the year after, you know, by the time I was eleven, and it was kind of like, look, you know, we've tolerated your fussing for the last year now. Like, you know, buck up, kid, uh -huh. and uh, you know, basically, man up, little girl, and stop complaining about your bad experience. <laughs> um, and I was always kind of uh, sensitive in school. Like I don't, I mean, to this day, I don't do well in noisy, crowded situations. Mm -hmm. And after the near-death experience, I was much more sensitive to crowds. And a classroom full of kids is just overwhelming sometimes. <laughs> and I, I really had difficulty just staying in the classroom. And I would beg for, you know, time out so that I could just go someplace like, can I please go sit in the library for an hour? Yeah. And they wouldn't let me do that. It was like, no, man up, kid. <laughs> and at one point, the guidance counselor had suggested that I could be allowed to draw in a sketchbook. I mean, because there wasn't any problem with me keeping up with the work. I was well ahead of any of the scholastic requirements. And they would have even skipped me a grade if I weren't already the youngest in my class and the smallest. And they were more worried that socially it wouldn't have made sense. Right. You know, um, as it was because I already seemed to be very um, reluctant to <laughs> go 
you know, grow up. <laughs> as such. Yeah. So yeah. jumping me into, you know, the next grade at school, which would have actually been an entirely other, a different school. So that was not the answer. So they said, fine, you can sit and draw in your sketchbook. And if that calms you down, you know, when you need to calm down, just do that. And it was actually my grandmother's suggestion. And she, she was very good at um, finding ways for me to cope. I was really very lucky that my living grandmother, she'd been musician and uh, very artistic. And she came up with a lot of helpful ways to get through all this stuff. So she had said, you know, the sketchbook, because I always had a sketchbook with me. I was always drawing. And that was going to be the one nice thing I could do when I was stressing out in school. Well, unfortunately, my grade six teacher didn't agree with this. And nobody told me that the grade six teacher wasn't going to like me doing this. I was told to do this. Right. And I was sitting in homeroom class and drawing in my sketchbook when the grade six teacher came over and hit me in the face. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's nice. Smallest kid in the class, 11-year-old girl. And she slapped me in the face <laughs> wow. and threw my book across the room. And the next thing that happened was my book picked itself up off the floor and flung itself at her. <laughs> and that was my first experience with poltergeist activity. And how did she react when that happened? Pretty badly. <laughs> I bet. Like badly towards you or just frightened? Badly towards, you know, it's funny because what happened after, you know, I've always found that with poltergeist activity that people, a lot of people will see it and then kind of talk themselves out of having seen it. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's the majority of reactions to it. When somebody sees something move, you know, they'll, they'll freak out at first. And then they'll just say, oh, though, I didn't really see that. Right. And the story became that I got up out of my desk, went across the room, picked up the book and flung it at her. Now, <laughs> it's not what happened. But <laughs> that was that was how things were explained. And I was the child from hell for doing this. Of course. And, you, you know, I became so convinced that adults were just the worst liars. <laughs> you know, they're just so dishonest. How can you possibly trust these people? I mean, seriously, did you not see what happened? <laughs> you know, and repeating what actually happened. Like, I, you know, I learned rather quickly that it was only going to get me in trouble. Right. Because then you were called a liar. Yeah. yeah. And delusional, you know. Mm. Did, the, did the other kids in the class witness it? Oh, yeah. How did they remember it? Nobody really talked, you know, it's funny because I had been a really popular child before the NDE and then after the NDE, suddenly I was the kid nobody wanted to go near. Oh. I was the weird kid. Um, and after that happened, I was really like, people mm -hmm. just stayed away from me. <laughs> and, and it was like, I, it was like nobody would admit to what had happened. And I mean, after a while, when you get used to hearing the official story, even I was starting to wonder, yeah, maybe... Yeah. Right. Am I remembering this wrong? <laughs> yeah. You know, and I, I'm, like I said, now that I've seen over the years how people do react to it, I'd be very shocked if anyone remembered anything but the original story. But that teacher did have a nervous breakdown. Hmm. Yeah. And I was blamed for it because I was the evil <laughs> child. And I mean, you know, things kept happening and I didn't know it was me. Um, I mean, it, that was the only really big thing. I mean, but little things like she'd reach for a piece of chalk and it would roll away from her, you know? Um, nice. Yeah. You know, or, or lights would go out or, you know, things would fall off her desk. <laughs> I mean, it just little things, but she blamed me and it seemed to be that, you know, she just knew somehow on some level that I was the one doing it to her. <laughs> and you kind of were. Yeah, but I didn't know that. Right. Did it happen with any of your other teachers or just her? Um, just her. Well, yeah, I guess at that age it was just her. But, you know, what happened after that was I became like a really bad kid. I mean, you know, they put me through so much testing. In the end, they actually gave me a day off 
of school a week for a couple of years so that my Mm. dad could look after me and deal with me. And my dad used to say, I don't see what the big deal is. You're a great kid. (laughs) (laughs) You know, I was like, yeah, it's like, you know, today's museum day. I get to stay with my dad and take, you know, like it was fine. And the teachers got a break for me, which they desperately needed. And, and I, you know, my marks weren't hurting, so it was fine. So yeah, I had a couple of years where, you know, at, at first it was every Wednesday was go to the child uh, psychologist's office, which was awful, <laughs> you know, which is stupid and uh-huh. awful. And I hated it. And I used to just fill out anything in the forms, just, oh, what, what shall I make them think I'm like this week? <laughs> it's, like, <laughs> it's like, you know, I have to be here. I don't have to be nice about it. <laughs> Right. Entertain yourself. Exactly. You know, I mean, shall I be a genius this week or shall I be severely disabled? I don't know. (laughs) You know, and I mean, I know they put me through the IQ testing and then my poor brothers got stuck through that, too, just to see if we were all weird. You know, Um, but in the end, in the end, I just started being a bad kid. So when the next time I was hit by a teacher, because that wasn't the only time. Oh, that's good. Yeah, next time I was hit by a teacher, it was a grown man. I was still the smallest kid in the class. And mysteriously, the tires on his car seemed to go flat. <laughs> well, and why, what did this teacher hit you for? I was standing in line for the library and giggling with a friend. <laughs> oh, well, that's that's a... Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. But I was a bad kid, so I got targeted by teachers. Yeah. Um, anything I did, they, you know, that's the evil kid. And I mean, at that point, I think that teacher in particular, he was apparently on medication for some illness he was on. And they said that, well, technically he was kind of stoned and didn't know what he was doing. I'm thinking, <laughs> okay, well, then why is he teaching French? <laughs> Just Wow. <laughs> yeah. So, and, but, you know, my parents were kind of bullied and said, well, you know, you have a bad kid. So, there's you you can't do anything about this we'll all deny it happened it's just her word against his Hmm. yeah so so that really i mean i was just after that i was a nightmare child (laughs) you know that that that, that is totally understandable because that's how anyone i think would react to that yeah so you know if i got punished by a teacher i would do things you know well i i'm not going to say what i would do but things happened (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> things yeah, happened. Were you, able, were you able to control it to some degree? Well, what was happening at that point was not um, psychokinetic. It was just happening. Oh. <laughs> That's, I mean, the psychokinesis stopped when I started being bad. I see. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, you know. So, so when you started acting out like a normal teen- teenager in that situation, then the psychokinetic stuff wasn't occurring. That's right. So if I if I dealt with my frustrations with spray paint... And, you know, right. or, you know, nail polish remover on a car. <laughs> so it was, it was like it, uh, it was, it was an escape valve if you tried to hold it in. That's right. So when I was trying to be a good child, the, the nice little girl I always was, that's when the psychokinesis was coming out. But when I just said, screw this, I'm just going to be as bad as, you know. <laughs> and the funny thing was, is once I turned into a bad kid, they all thought I was just being normal. Like, really, that's when that was when things were, oh, she's she's behaving like a normal teenager now. She must be okay. You know, she just, I, you know, we just found her in a carload of other drunk teenagers. Obviously, everything's fine. Right. I mean, it's a bad girl, but good girl. All right. That's exactly. Yeah. I mean, it's funny when I look at it that way. You know, when I had imaginary friends telling me to do my homework, I was clearly sick. And, you know, and when I had imaginary friends telling me not to get in the car full of the drunk friends and, you know, yeah. as an underage child, um, and I ignored that, then I was a healthy, normal teenager. <laughs> I mean, I, I can only imagine if I'd gotten pregnant at 15, what they said. <laughs> you know, like, like, it just seemed like everything was very backwards, as, you know, yeah. but that was... But- it, it was backwards, but it was normal to them. It's what they expected of you, not the stuff you were actually going through. Yeah, and I learned not to tell anybody anything about what I was experiencing. 
<laughs> so yeah. and and some things I didn't even know I was different about. Like I didn't realize that everyone didn't see auras. Ah. Now did you see them your whole life or No, that kind of hit me with puberty. Ah. That okay. was like boys. You know, the guys that <laughs> I was attracted to, oh my god, just lit up a room. <laughs> it was just and I was just horrified by that. <laughs> It's like, no, no, it can't. It's like I'm doomed. So how, how, how did you how did you realize other people didn't have the same experiences, uh, just by talking about them? Oh no, no, there's no way I would have talked about them. Oh, <laughs> um, actually, I figured that one out. Um, my first undergraduate degree was in fine arts, mm -hmm. and I figured them out from studio classes, where what I was drawing was not what everybody else was drawing. Ah, so you were drawing them with their their auras at first, and then I learned not to. Gotcha. And I also I also figured out ways to suppress seeing it. Hmm. Basically, I the great normalizer for me in my late teens was alcohol. <laughs> I bet. I bet <laughs> that it made me more like everybody else. Yeah, because it suppresses some of the stuff that that the sensitivities. Yeah. And so I wasn't seeing the ghosts and I wasn't seeing the auras. And I mean, that was how I got through university. I mean, I was 17 when I started my first undergraduate degree. And um, I, you know, I mean, I wrote exams drunk. I mean, people used to joke that I got better <laughs> marks and, you know, drunk writing an exam. Than, you know, and I'd soak up after the exams were over because at that point I didn't need to be drunk to tolerate being in the theater to write the exam. Right. You know, I mean, I couldn't I couldn't go into one of those huge um, lecture theaters sober. Yeah, it, it just wasn't an option for me. So, yeah, I was like the party girl. <laughs> I graduated with distinction, though, so it wasn't that bad. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how I'd have done if I were sober. But <laughs> yeah, because you would have had a whole bunch of different uh, stuff nagging at you. Yeah, although, you know, later on in graduate school, um, I often found good ways of cheating that way. <laughs> did did, the, did the, these things, besides the alcohol, did they fade naturally at all over time? I think, you know, I mean, as I got closer to 20, you know, 20 was kind of the age where suddenly I really was growing up, you know, um, I met my first husband at 21 and we had a house by then. And it has, I got much more interested in, in a life here. I, those things faded quite a bit. Uh -huh. Not completely though. You know, they, they, they were always there and they always kind of pop up every so often, but it wasn't continually. And, and I, I was much more, um, I was much more tolerant of being in crowded situations and I could, you know, I could go to the clubs and I could dance and I could do stuff where I, you know, the sensitivities now, I couldn't do that. <laughs> right. What, um, what about the night terrors? Did they fade at all? Not completely. I think they changed. I mean, I went, I went from the stage where I was having a lot of OBEs. The OBEs settled out down quite a bit and that was that was helpful but i i mean to this day i have night terrors <laughs> mm. you know it's never completely gone away it's just the content i think is quite different i don't have dreams about the you know the bad entity things it mm -hmm. it's more that i'll have nightmares about well, in some cases, like if something bad happens to someone, I know I've had nightmares about those events while they're taking place. Ah. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think, yeah, I, I was actually just working on the chapter about that <laughs> for my book. And which is, I was kind of on a bit of a downer to start the interview. I was trying not to think about that because that was a really sad one where um, I was serving in the military as a musician. And. Mm -hmm. One of my good friends, we were doing a show in Halifax, uh, a military tattoo. And it was one of those things where they were evening performances. But, you know, once you've 
played in a band for a couple hours at night, you you just can't go home and go to bed. <laughs> right. I mean, you're kind of all keyed up on all that energy. And so, and Halifax has just a phenomenal nightlife. And we go out and sort of enjoy the nightlife after the show until until we kind of calmed ourselves down and enough that we could sleep the next day. And then we'd sleep till five o'clock the next day and get up to the show again. Right, and right. Um, this one night we had gone to a club with a bunch of friends and I was very, I was the cautious one. I always stuck with a group of friends. I wasn't really interested in dating anyone at that point. And um, I, I just figured I was there for my summer job and have a bit of fun. And that was that. And um, one of my friends she stayed at the club with a guy that we didn't know very well. He was kind of a friend of a friend that we'd worked with. Mm -hmm. And uh, I I remember begging her, look, you know, come home with me and the rest of the group. Like, don't, don't go with somebody you don't know very well. And she insisted she'd be fine. Everything would be great. And so I went home with kind of the nerdy group that I hung out with, the euphonium players. <laughs> <laughs> the euphoniums and tubas who played risk every weekend <laughs> they were the safe guys in the band <laughs> right and um you know i went home with them and i go home safely and i had the worst nightmare that night of my friend being brutally raped oh yeah and i mean i woke up screaming and i thought okay, it's just a bad dream, it's just a bad dream that couldn't have really happened. And I mean, and it was, it was kind of one of those realer than real dreams. Mm -hmm. it, it, it just, it was so real, it was like I was right there. And um, I just kept telling myself, okay, this can't be real, this can't be real. And the next morning, um, I saw her and she was like, trying to cover up all the bruises from the attack. Um, she really had been brutally assaulted. And unfortunately, back then, being a woman in the military, you couldn't report that kind of thing. Mm. That it would get you sent home, you'd lose your summer job, you could be dishonorably kicked out of your regiment. Um, Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, it was a horrible situation. And, you know, that was just... It, I, I felt so guilty because, I, I mean, there was nothing I could have done. Right. But I still kind of felt like maybe there was something I should have done just because I saw it happening Well, it was happening. But yeah, that, those were the sort of dreams that that's that's how my nightmares kind of evolved over the years. And that concludes part one of the interview with Cheryl Lee Black. We're going to be airing the second part next week. As I said, if you are a patron, you will have a link to the second part uh, right away. So you'll be able to check that out and not have to wait a week to hear the rest of the conversation. If you want to become a patron, just go to wheredidtheroadgo.com. It's only $3 a month. It helps us out, and uh, eventually we're getting closer and closer to having a solid second show a week. There will be merchandise and other stuff coming.